Hi everyone, welcome to Tired Technician. Today we're going to be looking at configuring this, the Aruba 5400R series switch, but it should also apply to many other Aruba switches. We're going to start by plugging a micro USB cable into the USB console port of the switch, which I've circled above, and the other end into your computer or laptop. If you wait a while for Windows to install it, and then open Device Manager, the quickest way is to right click the Start button, and then click on Device Manager. Expand the Ports, COM and LPT section and look for the USB serial device. Make a note of its name in brackets, in this case it's COM3, and then we can just close Device Manager. Next we're going to open up PuTTY, a free terminal program, links in the description. Select the serial option and set the serial line to COM3 and push enter. It starts off with a load of legal blurb, push any key to continue. First up, we'll enter config mode by typing config and hitting return. We'll start the config by setting user password so we don't forget to later. For the manager, simply enter password space manager and this will prompt you for a password and then ask you for it again to make sure you got it right. Make sure this is a strong password as you don't really want anyone breaking into your switches. Now we'll do the same for the operator user. So type in password space operator. And then give this a strong but different password. Setting the name of the switch is next. It's easy as typing the hostname command followed by the name you want to give it. In this case, MSS, which identifies the site, followed by a function and then a number. Uh, we'll set the console timer options next, in case you accidentally leave yourself logged in. I've highlighted the ports of this effects. For the console port, it's a simple console space idle hyphen timeout and then number in seconds. I've chosen 900 here. It's similar for the USB connection as well, but you add serial hyphen USB after the idle timeout part. Once again, I chose 900 seconds. Time sync functionality is always useful to make sure your logs are the correct time. We'll use SNTP for this. The SNTP command lets you choose how SNTP is done. In this case, unicast or direct to a particular address. SNTP followed by an integer sets the time between polling the server, in this case 30 seconds. SNTP space server lets it know where to look. I set the priority to 2, but this can be uh, 1, 2 or 3, and then end it with the IP address of the time server. Next up, we need to know what rules to use for daylight savings. I'm going to be setting this one to Western Europe because that's where I am. And finally, tell the TimeSync service which of its set of settings to use, so SNTP. Next up, we'll set up a trunk, which will be used to connect a server. In Aruba terms, a trunk is when you use multiple ports as a single connection. I'm using port C1 and D1, which I've highlighted in the picture. The last two arguments are trunk ID, usually TRK and then a number, and then LACP, which lets us set the LACP connectivity. Uh, we'll set the default gateway next. Um, basically it's a standard root command. IP space root space 0.0.0.0 .0 space 0.0.0.0 followed by your router address. We'll use the IP routing command next. This lets the switch act as a router for its various VLANs and access to the default gateway. 
Time to label up some interfaces, I guess. Um, makes it easy to tell what they're for. So you type an interface, followed by the ID of the interface, A24 in this case, and this puts you into the interface config. Naming it is as simple as typing in name, followed by the name you want to give it. In this case, router1. Type exit, that will take you back to the main config section. Uh, we'll do this for a few more interfaces, giving them an easily identifiable name. In this case, we're using the legacy labeling to indicate that we're going to connect these to the existing LAN connections so we can have a bit of time to fail over and work through. We'll probably end up removing these ports in the future. Okay, next up, I think we'll set up the SNMP access to the non-sensitive public community. You simply enter SNMP hyphen server space community space public space unrestricted. Okay, we'll set up the out of band management ports, which is useful when you're configuring a switch that you've unplugged from the main network. So you type in OBM and push enter. We'll set it to DHCP bootp so it can get an address from any network the management module gets plugged into. You'll see it's simply IP space address space DHCP bootp and then exit back to the main config terminal. So we'll set up some VLANs next. Um, basically, they're the same as the interface command. But you type in VLAN followed by a VLAN ID, which in this case is 901. So you can give it a name, the same as you did for the interfaces. This should be descriptive as to what it's for. We'll set the untagged ports to this one, to the router interfaces that we set up earlier. So untagged A24, comma B24. We'll also let the tag packets for this VLAN come in from other ports. Type tagged. A1 hyphen A23 comma B1 dash B23 comma TRK1. Okay, we'll give it an IP address as well. This will be used for the gateway address for devices in this VLAN most commonly used for default gateways. It's basically IP space address space what you want the IP address to be and then the subnet mask for that IP. And as usual we'll exit back to the main config again and move on to the next VLAN. The next VLAN is basically the same method so I'll talk a bit about tagged and untagged VLANs while this is going on. Untagged ports automatically tag any incoming packets that haven't previously been tagged and that VLAN when coming into the selected port. It's useful when you know what it's going to be connected to or if you're going to be connecting old legacy switches that don't support VLANs. It's also useful to have set for clients that may connect that do not natively support VLAN tagging. The tagged ports let packets from that VLAN pass through as well as letting you set tagging on a connecting computer or device. This is also for any ports which may be serving virtual machines as you can set their network card VLAN, which will then let them connect to the proper network. If the tag setting is not available for a VLAN on a particular port, then a tag packet will be discarded if it is not available. Mm, I'll admit, that's probably the worst explanation in the world. Yeah, I know. Um, I'll probably make a video in future about VLANs. We'll hopefully explain it a bit better. But, you know... Not right now. Okay, um, I think I'll fast forward through the next few VLANs until we come across something a little different. I really need a fast forward sound effect, don't you think?
Okay, the next VLAN's got a few different settings that I'll explain as we go. The uh, the start of the config is basically the same. We'll set up the name and tagged VLANs. This time we won't be adding any untagged VLANs, and the reason for that will become clear shortly. Of course, doing the usual um, IP address setting so it can be a gateway for the subnet. Just checking the documentation a sec, sorry. Well, a new command now, IP helper hyphen address, and an IP address. This command takes broadcast packets and sends them onto a specific server on a different VLAN. It's useful for cross VLAN DHCP, which is what we're using it for here. Uh, next up is simply the command voice, which simply tells the switch to automatically tag packets from any device that it identifies as a phone. Uh, we'll have another fast forward now, I think. Okay, so we're going to set some options for VLAN 1, also known as the default VLAN, and we'll give it a name to reflect this. Basically, we're turning everything off. Adding the no keyword to the beginning of a command turns the option off. Don't worry, we're nearly done now. Thanks for sticking around this long, though. Uh, we'll set up spanning tree now. Spanning hyphen tree turns spanning tree on. We'll set it up for the trunk. Um, by specifying spanning hyphen tree space TRK1 space priority space 4. This basically sets it up for when non lacp clients connect to both ports to stop a loop. Then we'll configure the defaults. Spanning tree, priority zero, with priority zero meaning the highest priority. Now we're going to turn off servers and settings that we don't want or need. No TFTP server turns off the switch's TFTP server. No auto run stops the switch from running config scripts from USB automatically. No DHCP config hyphen file update will stop the switch from passing DHCP information the main container linked to a config file for the switch. This can be a security risk if a rogue DHCP server is put online. Similarly, no DHCP image-file-update will prevent the switch from installing firmware updates advertised over DHCP. Finally, we end with write mem, which saves all the information to the switch permanently. These were temporary until now, a reboot would erase them. Now we can either type log out or continue to type exit until I, we get asked if we want to log out. I chose the exit method so I have time to finish speaking. After this, just close party and we're done. And that's the basics of an Aruba 5400R series switch. It's not necessarily the recommended config, but it's enough to get you going. Nice starting point. If you found this video useful and informative, give us a like, comment, maybe even subscribe. If you've got anything you want us to make a video on in the future, Put it down in the comments and we'll see what we can do. Thanks for watching, we'll catch you again. I can't believe it took six months to edit this video.